Good afternoon and welcome to Creative Climate Communications, where we will explore metaphor, imagination, transformation, and sustainability in what I call a Calypsonian's case for reparations. Global inequality has increased dramatically over the last 200 years. Driven in large part by colonialism, industrialization has degraded the landscapes of former colonized nations, making them particularly vulnerable to natural disasters. Much of the Caribbean was stripped of its forests to build plantations. 80 years from now, climate change could kill as many people as all infectious diseases. However, these deaths will be concentrated in the world's poorest countries. Despite the fact that small island developing states produce very little greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change, the World Health Organization and the UN recognize that they are on the front line of climate change impacts. The great climate migration that will transform the world is just beginning. To adapt, the international community that will, will need a different approach to politics. There are two ways forward, climate reparations or climate colonialism. Reparations would use international resources to address inequalities caused or exacerbated by the climate crisis. It would allow for a way out of the climate catastrophe by tackling both mitigation and migration. The climate colonialism alternative, on the other hand, would mean the survival of the wealthiest and devastation for the world's most vulnerable people. In 2019, youth climate activist Greta Thunberg stated, I don't want you to feel hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. Youth have always been on the forefront of movements for justice and social change, but eco-anxiety, a term coined by the American Psychiatric Association, stemming from an overemphasis on stark scientific facts, has created a barrier to believing that climate change is solvable. There's a hope gap that needs to be bridged. There are five key concepts that researchers have identified about climate change that people need to understand before they feel inspired to make a difference. And these are that scientists agree on the facts. Climate change is real. Human activity is the main cause. The situation is really bad, but there's still hope. There's a dance between reason and emotion and how we make sense of the world. The brain has two very different processing systems, the experiential system and the analytic system. Both are crucial when it comes to inspiring action on climate change. To date, however, most communication about climate change has been conveyed in solely analytic terms, focusing on that it's bad element. What is needed now is a sense of hope that change is possible. But where can we find such hope? I believe that we find it in action. The good news is the world has changed before and when it did, it wasn't because a president, a prime minister, a CEO or a celebrity decided that it had to. Change didn't begin with the King of England magnanimously deciding to end slavery or the president of the United States boldly giving women the right to vote or the National Party of South Africa deciding one day that it would be a really good idea to end apartheid. It began when ordinary people, people of no particular power, wealth, or fame, decided that the world could and should be different. We are the people who changed the world before, and we are the people who can change it again. In 2021, Greta Thunberg started addressing that concept of hope in terms of actionable hope. Once we start to act, she says, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then, and only then, hope will come. But if action gives rise to hope, then what actually causes us to act? Scientists used to think that the brain worked like a computer, that it gathered data through the eyes and stored it in our memories, crunched the numbers, and then spat out logic, and that when it was acting on emotion, it was misfiring. But neuroscientists now tell us that it is not logic, not judgment, not reason, not data or facts that causes us to act. Our go switch comes from our emotions. The experiential system is significantly more powerful in terms of shaping most of our daily decisions and responses to the world around us. 
Professor Angus Fletcher, an Ohio State practitioner of story science with dual degrees in neuroscience and literature says, when we act on our emotions, it is not a misfire. It is in fact, the fire. This is why the arts and culture are so crucial to inspiring action on the climate crisis. Arts integration learning is a framework of experiential learning, which provides an equitable environment for all learners. By engaging students in a creative process that authentically connects the performing arts with the physical and social sciences, we can transform the traditional learning experience to one in which students construct personal meaning about the effects of climate change through an art form and imagine and achieve new solutions for their community. Active engagement with arts and culture is the fire, the gateway to inspiring actionable hope on the climate crisis. And as it turns out, neuroscientists agree. I want to go back to that gap between what scientists suggest needs to be done about the climate crisis and the human institution's slowness and inaction in doing what is needed. Metaphors are a way of sparking the imagination so that we can visualize new possibilities. Whilst imagining may occur outside reality, the alternatives it brings to light can provide ideas on how to move people and organizations towards change and even transformation to a different reality. In the case of climate change, that alternative reality is one where life on the planet goes on because of the transformation of existing human systems so that the planetary systems will hold, allowing life to be sustained. Metaphors have the potential to spark a transformation, to invoke the need for action to quite literally make a sustainable future for our species and many others simultaneously. And metaphors are the key to a good calypso. Says Dr. Hollis Liverpool, the mighty chalk dust, to be a good Calypsonian, you must be a good metaphor man so that you will be able to mix and be very creative with words. Using metaphors is the best way to say the inappropriate appropriately and get away. I want to share with you an example of an arts integrated unit on climate change that I'm designing that I call climate colonialism. The question that we'll ask across several subject areas is who should pay the costs for climate change related disasters in small island developing states and I call it a Calypsonian's case for climate reparations. Originating in the struggle for emancipation, we all know that Calypso is characterized by its witty and imaginative treatment of diverse and often challenging themes. As a genre, it is heavily anti-colonial, anti-imperial, and anti-elitist. Voices from communities on the front line of the climate crisis are crucial in exploring solutions. Without them, there will be major blind spots. In this unit, students will compose their own calypsos that explore the percussive rhythmic beats and call and response patterns of calypso, whilst challenging us to consider specific issues surrounding climate change in the Caribbean. Some of the learning objectives will be analyzing poetry and songs that outline how the historical process of colonialism is intrinsically linked to climate change. Students will examine how some climate solutions continue to perpetuate colonialism. They'll discover the origins of Calypso, design their own homemade percussion instruments, and apply call and response techniques and syncopated rhythms in a song. Finally, they'll write and perform an original Calypso about the consequences of climate change. Some of the standards that we'll cover uh, and find authentic connections through will be music, history, geography, and science. I've designed four building blocks into the unit, which is all about amplifying the voices of young people who will inherit this mess. I call it aware, care, dare, and share. As students become aware of their collective history and the impacts of climate change on marginal communities in the Caribbean, they start to care. This encourages them to dare to write and perform their own calypsos in which they identify perpetrators and demand climate reparations. Finally, they share these songs with local and international communities, speaking their truth to power. Some of the outcomes will be a growing awareness in secondary school students about climate change impacts on marginal communities in the Caribbean and other small island nations. 
some of the intermediate outcomes, we'll be sharing that knowledge with others. And the long-term outcomes that I envision include putting pressure on governments to consider climate reparations for Caribbean countries. In conclusion, voices from communities on the front line of the climate crisis are crucial in exploring solutions. Without them, there will be major blind spots. As a framework of experiential learning, arts integration provides equitable learning environment. Through a traditional and engaging art form, we can instill awareness about climate change, promote personal responsibility whilst identifying perpetrators, and give marginalized people a global voice in insisting governments find solutions. Do you see authentic connections between other arts disciplines and the physical and social sciences that could work in similar ways? I would love to discuss that with you. Thank you so much.